There we go. All right, you guys, welcome back. We're going to talk about some best practices and bad habits when drawing, especially in particular drawing um, things from photographs, things from life, uh, people, animals, and digitally, because they don't discuss that in the Proco videos that I've recommended. So a lot of you guys say that you have some drawing experience, maybe not tons and tons of it, and I don't know how much of that would be on a digital tablet, but it's similar, but not exactly the same. Uh, did you guys all watch the video, by the way, the, the Proco thing? I did, not. did not? It's in the traditional section, so. No? Okay. Well, he talks about using charcoal and newsprint uh, to do figure drawing. And there's a particular way that he sits. There's a particular way that he holds the instrument. And all of that's really good advice if you're going to use charcoal. We're not going to be using charcoal if we're using digital tools, though. Even if we have tools that simulate charcoal, and I don't think I have anything convenient here, maybe like this brush if I made it really small or something like that. But we can't hold our tools the same way. It's just not possible with a drawing tablet. Um, if any of you have yours in front of you and you feel the surface of the drawing tablet, it's plastic. And so it kind of slides around. If you try to hold your instrument in any way other than like with a nice power grip, it just slides all over the place. It's crazy. It's sloppy. It doesn't make any sense to have like a loose grip with a digital drawing tool. So unfortunately, we have to tripod our fingers way down near the top of the, of the pen so that you're very much near the drawing surface, and that can get exhausting. I don't know about you guys, but my hand sometimes hurts from drawing long periods on a digital tablet because I end up giving it like a kung fu grip and really trying to control exactly where my uh, tablet is going. And that's the first thing you guys should not do, okay? If you're used to gripping a pencil or a pen for like uh, writing, you know, like in school, then this is not quite the same grip, but it's pretty similar to that. The difference is that if you do the same kind of strokes, then it would be like little tiny quick, hi, I'm Tabor, tiny little strokes that are only about like a finger width in difference in their size and that's not going to make a very nice looking drawing. If we're trying to draw something like that, then we end up doing this, which is a really, really bad habit. No fuzzy lines. Fuzzy, bad. Don't do that. Okay. Instead, we want to do something similar to what Proko talks about in, in his video, which is drawing from the shoulder. Okay. So if you look at your arm with your drawing instrument in your hand, you've got a little bit of, let me get a fresh sheet here, you've got a little bit of uh, drawing ability just with your fingertips alone, but not very much. Right here, I've got my hand planted on my monitor, and I'm just kind of making strokes wherever I can reach without moving my hand at all. And it's about that distant, like maybe I can get a little bit closer down here, but it's really uncomfortable. So that's about my total range, okay? If instead of doing that, I put my hand on my monitor but I allow my wrist to move now I can do about this far okay and it's better I can get a little bit closer to myself I can get a little bit farther away it's better it's smoother but now you're going to endanger yourself of getting like carpal tunnel or repetitive stress injury or something like that not to mention that if you just look at how large my screen is here I'm only using a small fraction of it still it's like why should I do that um, at this point, I could start to involve my elbow. If I involve my elbow, I can go easily the entire length of the screen up and down like this. The only limitation then is that I can't move off of this small line here without involving my shoulder, right? So with just my elbow, I can swing all the way over here and use my wrists and fingers to reach a little bit. And over here, use my wrist and fingers to reach a little bit down here. But that's it. So now I've like got half the screen. So drawing over here and no drawings over here. And that's silly. You know, we wouldn't want to do any of that stuff. So what we recommend instead is draw from your shoulder means use every part of your arm to draw all at the same time. 
don't just use the smallest little bits and also draw big bigger drawing is easier uh, it's smoother there's a lot more stability you don't have to worry about not being able to see or whether or not you included enough pixels in your canvas so I just drew a tiny little circle there with my fingertips right I'll draw a slightly bigger one involving and I have to involve my shoulder at this point it's just painful if I don't um, involving my hand and my elbow I'll draw a slightly bigger one now fully using my arm I'll draw an even bigger one Whee! draw an even bigger one now I've got to actually lean my body so I can get the whole canvas Whee! okay so as I started doing that more and more and more let's take a look at this little one now look how blurry and shitty that little one looks don't draw like that right use your whole canvas we got this big big canvas we got all of these pixels that we can use don't just like draw in one tiny corner of it like oh I hope you don't see my drawing I want to hide it behind like a tree or a bush or something like that no it's it's bad even this one here which is serviceable enough is still pretty blurry and indistinct if I make a couple like hard lines next to it to see we've really only got like a few pixels to represent what our drawing lines are supposed to be here it's not that great this is starting to get decent this is way better and then once we get as large as like the whole canvas then we're really starting to kind of get absurd you probably don't need to draw over the entirety of your canvas let's see if I can do it there we go but you do get nice line quality you don't have to worry about resolution at that point so use your whole screen to draw as much of it as you can possibly do especially if your tablet is small okay if you've got a relatively small tablet on your lap then you need to zoom you need to move your view around you need to go over to the thing that you are trying to draw on so they'll say I'm detailing this circle for some reason get it big on your screen zoom in make sure that it fits somewhere in a central location then if you think oh I wanted to draw this a little bit higher like that do a few practice strokes using your arm to draw then try to hit it with a minimum of lines so that it's not super gross looking okay if you have to erase it's fine go through clean it up fix up some of your lines but always aim to be making nice big strokes rather than tiny little scratchy strokes zoom back out take a look at what you did decide oh here's something else that needs help zoom in move over there okay this is the zoom level I would be working on if I'm working on this circle way in here so it's filling up my drawing space so it's not so different compared to the big ones anymore then I can fix it up switch to my eraser tools get rid of some of the crap that I left in there and at this point you may then need to shrink your tools also okay the size of this pencil that I'm using right now I can see up the top is 10 pixels well that's not a very precision instrument at this level of zoom anymore is it okay so for that reason I might want to shrink it let's tap it down like to five pixels so now that's the line that I'm dealing with okay so I can erase out or whoop, let me go back in go back in doop, doop, doop. there we go so I'm gonna erase out some of this just to leave it as like guidelines for myself switch back to my pencil tool bring it into a more comfortable position take a few practice strokes and then I don't know why I was practicing in the wrong direction there we go so now I've got sharper more defined lines they're not perfect but I'm gonna shrink my eraser too they're not perfect but they're a lot better than it was let's zoom out that's a little bit sharp for this level of zoom but it's detail work so it's okay right I wouldn't want to leave my pencil this sharp and tiny way out here because now it looks like a scalpel I want some of that forgiveness some of that softness so I'd bring it back up to my size 10 to make it like an actual malleable pencil or maybe even larger if I was drawing really really big I might have a big blurry tool like that okay does that make sense to you guys what I'm saying right change your zoom level change the size of your tool where it's appropriate and get used to doing that stuff rapidly because that's going to be a lot of uh, what you're doing as you're just navigating around and planning what you're doing do you guys understand like why I might want a blurry tool to work with sometimes 
and why I might want a sharp, precise tool to work in other times. Does that make any sense? Doing something far away would want it to be a little bit more blurred. Oh, for like stylistic purposes? Yeah. Um, sure, that's one reason, but I'm just talking about like drawing. Like assuming I'm not trying to put a lens effect on anything, why might I choose a bigger tool, bigger, blurrier, indistinct tool compared to a sharper, smaller, more precise one? Like, why wouldn't I just use this last one all the time? Well, wouldn't it indicate, like, the, the thickness of the thing, too, and the feel of the item, or depending on what you're drawing? It, it could, but I think you're still talking about stylistic things. So I'm just talking about functionally drawing as far as I'm trying to figure out what it is that I'm going to put on the canvas. I'm trying to feel out the, the angle, the size, the direction, that sort of thing. Not really. I mean, you can still see that, right? Like I'm zoomed way out and that thin little line is still visible. Yeah, no, not really. Um, so it's more about forgiveness. Can you draw perfect shapes the first time every time? And if anyone, and if anyone says yes, they're a witch. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Um, us mortals, the answer is no, right? So let me bring it down to a very small, precise size. And then I'm going to draw big. I'm going to draw like a, a cube or two, okay? So I'll put like a face down here like this, and then like this, and I'm going to like just get some lines falling back this direction. And it's just kind of harsh to draw like this. It's like, oh, I didn't even get a cube, so let me bring that wall back. Okay, and then I'll get rid of that stuff. I have a question. Yeah. Um, is this supposed to apply for uh, when you're doing it just with your hand? Because I'm not familiar with this uh, technology at all. <laughs> I I am using my hand. Okay, but meaning um, I can apply the same techniques with my hand, then I don't need a top. Uh, if you're do, are you using charcoal? Yes. So what I'm talking about is sort of this digital analogy to charcoal. So you are using tools for which you can pick a different tool. So um, in your case, you've got uh, maybe whoo, I went the wrong way. You've got maybe big block charcoal, right? Which is a big blunt stick that you don't have to like. You can't make any sharp edges with it because it's just huge, right? But you've also got vine charcoal, which is this smaller, thinner edge. And then you've even got pencils where you can shave away the pencil bits and get the charcoal sticking out of the top. And you could even shave that down further and get a very, very precise little edge. So this is sort of the digital version of that, right? This tool has a job. So does the vine charcoal which is a little bit more precise but still blurry, so does the pencil where you can sharpen it all the way. They all have a job to do. Does that make sense to you? Yes, it's just that um, you know, I'm familiar to the whole thing and I'm not too good with technology. Um, you're not, Senior. yeah, you're not forced to use digital drawing tools in this class. If you want to do the entire class with paper and pencil or charcoal and newsprint, that's fine with me. But what I'm talking about is too many of our students are using digital tools. I'm helping them to understand how to use it best. Okay. Cool. Okay. But that is a good point because if some of you aren't familiar with charcoal, then this is kind of some of the tools that you would use. You have big blocks of it. You have vine charcoal. You have pencils. Um, and then you could even, if you want to be more precise than that, you could get a mechanical pencil, which comes all the way down to a tiny, tiny little single point where you could come down to razor precision if you wanted to. Okay. But here's the point. If this was my sketch, let's just take like my, my drawing of this pencil right here. If this was my sketch, okay, it's easier to ignore the exact placement of any one of these lines because it's blurry, because it's indistinct, because it doesn't constitute any kind of precision or detail. But these lines look really sure of themselves. 
these lines look like they were put there with a definite hard purpose should not be moved absolutely serious does that make sense to you guys yeah. Yeah. okay so when you're drawing indistinct not quite sure things use bigger tools use blurrier tools so I don't know what I'm gonna draw over here I'm gonna draw the mr. planters peanut guy okay so I know he's a peanut so he's got like this kind of shape and I kind of want him to like have his shoulder up and be leaning on his cane or whatever like that and uh, I want him to cross his legs and look sassy because he always looks sassy so I know he's gonna have his big shoes and this one's like like that I think and a little bit like that and is his head his upper body I can't even remember it's like is he like here or is he like here the first one. this one looks horrifying now that I've done that so we're gonna hide that under his top hat there we go get out of here that's his tumor his little tumor friend okay <laughs> so mr. peanut and does that mean his shoulder would be here yeah, I, I, the mr. mr. peanut is a nightmare yeah. god why did I choose that okay well here's his little friend <laughs> they did what <laughs> the, and the planters peanut baby you guys are, are describing a nightmare universe to me now um, I'm gonna look that up after class because you frightened me so much but for now we'll just say here's here's my little sketch of this planters peanut guy obviously don't quite know what I'm doing here but it would be a good first step for a sketch now if I start to get closer then I see blurry indistinct not quite focused lines and without even erasing I know oh yeah I should put something a little bit more definite here I should figure out exactly where that goes so typically with digital tools we could either erase out locally and draw over the top of it if you want to or we could just turn this layer down halfway maybe a little bit less make a new layer draw on top of it but now I'm gonna shrink my drawing tool a bit so now I'm down to that big and so I'm got it nice big zoomed in like I said we're not gonna draw this big I'm gonna come in here and say oh, okay so he's got this kind of attitude I would like to bend him over a little bit more so now here's his back push him just a little bit farther that way and I'm being a little bit more careful Let's see should I bend his front forward a little bit yeah maybe a little and then maybe a little bit skinnier so something like this so still trying to draw a nice big shape so that would be the difference between a first and second pass kind of drawing is that these look a little bit more sure of themselves they're not a hundred percent there but they're darker more distinct more focused and then I can go in and clean it up manually so take out some of the parts that I don't like lumpy bits and actually I think I would get rid of that entirely and smooth that out a little bit more switch back to my drawing tool and I'll, I'll just leave my sketch visible there and then fill in just a little bit more detail in any place where I'm struggling zoom way in and potentially also rotate my canvas just like you would a piece of paper to help with drawing this part I didn't like that that one was sticking so far out there so I think something a little bit more torpedo like like this is probably what I want maybe a little bit more flow there okay so don't always use the maximum precision tool the problem with digital tools is you've always got available to you the maximum precision tool it's just a, a set of options over here you could always pick a one pixel wide brush if you wanted to so why shouldn't you well mostly it's because it's gonna make your drawing look unpleasant and it's going to fool your eye into thinking that you've made decisions before you actually should have made them so now even just with this peanut shape you can kind of tell which parts I've worked on longer which parts I haven't worked on as much so they're open for interpretation so as I continue around this character filling in parts then it's easier for me to tell oh okay yeah I didn't really mean it there I need to just keep editing okay does that make sense yeah 
Yes, sir. Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, so those are a few things. Uh, other things, you may have noticed me doing some of the um, better habits while I was drawing the sides of this peanut. Just kind of a good example because it's a weird shape. Um, is that when I was coming around and fixing like the side of this, I didn't go like that. Okay. That was, I didn't even count how many strokes that was. And this applies for pencil, charcoal, digital tools, whatever, but it was too many. Okay. Is one possible? Maybe. But you might not. Would be insane. Huh? Say again? The undo history would be insane. Well, you know, I tend to just like undo once, try it again, undo once, try it again. Is that what you're talking about? Like that would be too punishing to go again and again and again and again and again? No, I mean, if you, if you did so many lines and then had to, uh, like, I don't like the way that looks, undo, 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 oh, undo, undo. Yes. Okay, the line is gone. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I get what you're saying. If you, for some reason, like let's say there's some very difficult shape and you're trying to reproduce this sort of thing, but you haven't drawn it yet and so you're going around carefully, 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 sometimes you have to make these shorter strokes and you're just not going to be able to get away with it. If you have to fix, the eraser tool is going to be your key here. Don't undo. Don't undo 40 times. Don't undo 20 times. Just erase and try again. Okay. But what I'm trying to get at is you should try to use the biggest, smoothest strokes you can. Look, I'm struggling with this curve a lot. You guys know why? I didn't zoom in. It's going to be way harder to draw small. So I should make this big. I should rotate this to a comfortable angle. Ah, so much more comfortable. Let me erase that out again. Okay. Now I've got this angle where it's like diagonal. I'm a right-handed person, by the way. So my shoulder is down here somewhere, and I can reach in this direction easily. So I've rotated it like this so that I can easily go up and down in that direction. So this one is possible, right? This one right here would be a little bit more difficult. Okay, so if I'm going to attempt that next part, so here's my first stroke. Ah, much better. Okay, I should rotate again. And now it's back into this nice orientation. Take a couple practice looks at it and then make a nice line. Maybe rotate again, down and around. Okay. And I don't have the steadiest hand in the world. I'm not really an inker, but I can help myself out at least by moving the screen around into a, a nice position as I trace out this figure. Something like that. Okay, so then once I'm done, come back out. We can look at this whatever bullwinkle moose thing that I drew. Okay. So you guys kind of get that? Hairy lines don't work. They don't look good. They take far too much effort. You're not going to be able to undo them. And you're not going to train yourself to have the kind of control over your tool that you need. I can't make the same curve every time. It's going to be a little bit different every time. And it's going to be up to you which ones you like and which ones you don't. So some of these are flatter up on the top. Some of them are curvier. Some of them, the end point goes to the left. Some of them, it goes down diagonally. In order to get that kind of precision, I would have to really practice um, that kind of stroke. Okay, But some of these would probably be virtually identical. You know, like the first couple of these, they're pretty similar. The next couple, they're similar to each other, not to the first ones. You don't have to be that picky, okay? You need some sort of shape here, put it in, but treat everything like a rough draft the first time, okay? This little scratchiness says, I want to carve out the perfect little shape right now the first time. It's not going to happen, okay? So even the feeling behind why you're doing that is, is not going to really be valid. Okay. Does this make sense to you guys? Yes. Anybody feel unduly targeted? <laughs> I'm talking about you specifically. I haven't even looked at your work yet. It might be. Okay. So 
yeah, little little scratchy hairy lines, bad habit. Okay, another thing, and this one, unfortunately, I'm guilty of this next one, would be you're trying to make a shape. Um, I'll just make some kind of an S shape. Okay, you're trying to make a shape, and then instead of just leaving it that, you go back over it a few times. Okay, when should I have stopped? I should have stopped immediately, okay, but I didn't. And sometimes you won't, because maybe this line over here was not the one you wanted. You actually wanted this one on the far side over here. It's a bad habit to, like, let's say I'm going to draw a coin. I'm going to take a few practice swings. And by that, I mean I have my tool just above the page or just above the monitor. And I'm moving it in the pattern that I'm going to draw without touching. And then I start touching lightly and then I push enough to see what I'm drawing. At that point, we're basically fine. But if I keep doing that, oh, whoa, whoa, all the different ways that my arm gets bumped and I'm not very stable start to show. And now where exactly is my shape? Is it the inner edges? Is it the outer edges? Is it like the average of somewhere in the middle? I wouldn't know without coming back in and erasing a lot of stuff out of here to shave back down and find the shape that I intended the first time. And it's a big mess. So this is a, a bad habit. Unfortunately, I do still do this one. Try to try to not, but making too many lines, even for something that you have a definite idea about. Okay. So the solution to this is I, I could just call them practice swings or practice strokes, right? Is that if I want to make a line between here and here, then I want to line up my canvas, get my drawing tool moving over the surface, get comfortable, and then just practice it a few times at a comfortable speed before I try to hit it. Oh, that's the most precise line oh, I've ever done the first time. I'm so proud of myself. Too bad next time I'm going to miss. Okay, let's try it again. Take a couple practice hits and then whoop, missed, but you know, straight. This is close enough for a sketch doesn't have to be that precise okay so do some practice lines before you start drawing something down I'll know that you haven't if I start seeing this okay if I see too many lines all over each other or let's let's make it a less little less ridiculous here's a bunch of light lines and then you have your one definite line well that's the same thing You've got better control over the pen pressure, but it's the same problem. You're doing far, far too many lines when one would do. Okay, And if you've already done it, you realize too late, then use your eraser tool to come back and get rid of the little ghosty lines so that you have just yours remaining. Okay. Yeah, and it'll eventually scratch through the paper, score the paper sometimes, uh, but that practice is really good and if you can draw like a nice light little um, guide like that at that point you could stop and say is this right oh I wanted to move this line over here so now practice that instead okay and say oh, okay that's that's where I want it to be there here okay so maybe I could turn this into two strokes one on this side one on that side and now it's a little bit more under control. Okay. So try to break yourself of that habit. It's a little bit tough, but you can do it. Okay. All right. Uh, more. Let's talk about more, unless you guys have questions about that one. You guys good? Very good. Okay, very good. Uh, I'm going to switch to my other pencil. My other pencil is a little bit denser uh, for this next one, because here's a bad habit. I'm trying to draw something and I go, here is what I'm drawing. Shape goes here, arm goes here. And it's like, whoa, ease up a little bit. There's no room for interpretation here. This is pressing too hard, okay? You do this with traditional tools, you're gonna tear a hole in the paper, okay? You do this with digital tools, you may damage your device but you're also not taking advantage of the fact that these things have whoa, pen pressure. So here's light pen pressure. Here's medium, hard. This is what hard pen pressure should look like. Okay, 
dense, close to black, but this is, I'm pushing it so hard that the monitor tries to move. Okay, you should never push that hard. There's no reason to. Not only is it a bad thing, but it requires that you um, do a very intense grip on your tool and it runs the risk of like slipping out of your fingers and just going somewhere crazy uh, or shifting your uh, your monitor or your tablet around. So definitely don't press that hard. If you need a stroke that's like that, you need a different tool. You need like an ink tool that is naturally dark like this one or this one or something. I'm not pressing hard with those brushes. They just don't have very much opacity pressure. That's all. Okay. But with this tool, you see that it has the range to go to full black intense. But why would I do that? This is more like how dark that should be. These ones over here. Okay. So pressing way, way too hard. Don't do that. Get some hand control. Practice it. You know, that's what you're in a class for after all. If you're new to digital drawing tools or if you're even just new to drawing in general, some of the mechanical practice is getting comfortable drawing straight lines, getting comfortable drawing curves or perfect circles. <sighs> perfect circle. I'm going to put this perfect circle in air quotes. There we go. Perfect circle. Anyway, I need more practice. Um, getting comfortable doing complex curves, right? And trying to do them with a minimum number of strokes so that they're more beautiful, right? And then also controlling the pressure. So not too light where we can't see anything that you've drawn and not too heavy where everything is just screaming at us, okay? So those are a few things that will commonly happen as well. Some of you will inevitably draw very, very light everything. So we'll get like, okay, here's where the upper body is, and then here's where the hips are, and I see the legs going out over here, and he's bending that one. And you'll turn this in and genuinely go like, yep, that's it, that's what I saw. I saw all of this stuff right here. I'm like, what stuff? Where, where is that guy? Oh, he's right there. I mean, you gotta, you gotta zoom in, maybe turn the contrast up on your monitor or something like that. But yeah, it's, it's all there. And I believe you, but where was the commitment in this, right? It's okay if you draw like this in your first couple of strokes in like the first minute of the drawing or something like that, but then start to make decisions and say, okay, I put it vaguely in this position, but this is the line that I'm gonna commit to. And then because his butt's on the, on the floor, I'll bring a little bit of muscle out this way, but generally he's pinching in the front and leaning over on the side. And oh no, it's Mr. Peanut again, he's back. Okay, but commit to something so that we can actually see it. And if you need to make repairs, that's okay, right? Get rid of parts that you're not gonna need. We'll say the back is going to be flatter and squarer over here, okay? Now I probably just went too far with that one because usually I use my other pencil, but that's okay. Uh, and then maybe you need to adjust the position of things. So this head should be farther down. So I'll put it over here, okay? And you'd see the more that I would work on this, probably the darker all of these lines would get, the more distinct, the more the erasing would take away the smallest pieces or the, the earliest pieces, sorry, not the smallest, the earliest pieces so that we no longer see them anymore and we would slowly start to commit to whatever this final drawing was supposed to look like. Okay, so neither too hard nor too soft, just right, just like Goldilocks said. I don't think she said that. Do you guys get it, right? Yes. Yeah? yeah? Okay, let's talk about another one. I'm going to get rid of these layers, make a new one. Um, the stability of your strokes, okay? By that, I mean like when you make a line, does it do this? Uh, or does it do this? Straight. Or does it do this? Okay, unintentionally sometimes they'll do this. This would represent to me, and I usually see these um, quite a lot, a perfect straight line is a little bit suspicious sometimes. Okay, so it's okay if they bend or bow just a little bit. A tiny bit of that is pretty natural anyway especially in a figure, you're not gonna get 
perfect ruler straight lines, but having one of these guys is weird. Okay, You may already know what happens uh, when your lines do this, but if you try to draw a straight line, but instead of drawing at a comfortable speed, you draw way too slow. Ooh. Is that a straight line? Yeah, but it's kind of bouncing all over the place. Okay, I did it, and I think that even if I drew a faster line from point to point, it would probably look just as straight as that one, but let's try it. Let's go. Is there enough of a difference that you guys can clearly see between those two? Yeah? There's a dark one. There's a very light one. Yes. But all three of those lines, right, they are confident. There's none of that wobble and wiggle, okay? Compared to this one where it was very meticulously drawn. And there's this element of feeling that your viewer is going to get from that. It's weird, but it's true. They'll be able to tell that that's a labored line as opposed to like a carefree line. Okay. So the speed that you move around the screen, it has a bearing on the beauty of your drawings. Find a comfortable speed. Too slow, and it's going to start to look really neurotic. Ugh. The pen pressure on digital tools will fluctuate a lot and on paper you're probably going to get some wobble in the tip and get kind of lumpiness okay slow circles oh I hate drawing slow circles <laughs> okay the same thing though is true for fast lines or lines that you have drawn too fast um, whatever your handedness the tendency is that if this is the direction the line was going initially if you are right-handed, this side will either start too high or start too low. And this side usually, I think, will tip off this direction because you're hitting the extreme of the rotation of your arm. So you'll get kind of an S like that, or sometimes you'll just get an arc like this when you intended a straight line. Okay, So don't be too wild with your lines. If you see someone and they're doing something really cool, they're, I don't know, in the Olympics and they're throwing discus and you go, oh, the, their line of action is... Ah! Just like that, it's like, whoa, think for a second. Is it really? Did you really intend this line? Did you really intend this line? Did you think about it at all? Or did you just put a fun, frenetic line down on the page and however it kind of just showed up is what you're going to stick to, OK? When we get to the faster, more energetic drawings, sometimes people get carried away and they want to be Jackson Pollock all of a sudden and just say that like the process is the art. Uh, not in this class. In this class we're after accuracy and we're after um, skills that will help you to do whatever kind of art you want to do. But we're not just trying to like have a super fun drawing session that doesn't really mean anything. Okay. So don't draw so fast that you lose control. I see it all the time with circles and with um, ellipses that people are intimidated by drawing circles. And so instead of setting a pace, they just go, ha, 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 there it is. Ha, 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 wah, wah. And you see these overlapping tips? That's what happens when you draw too fast with a circle, is you just completely miss your target. You shouldn't have to miss like that. You should get at least close, like that, right? They're different, but they're not miles out. And if you go too slow, well, of course you're going to hit your target, but you might uh, take a shortcut by accident or something like that and flatten out one side. Okay. So hopefully all of these kind of concerns are familiar to you. <laughs> I know they're familiar to me, unfortunately. I've done every single one of them a hundred times. Oh, cool. Very good. Um, by the way, on the YouTube channel, I also have a uh, full practice live stream that I did some time ago, which covers a bunch of warm up um, activities that you can do. And many of them are similar to these. And they might help you if you guys need to get more confidence in your lines. Uh, let's talk about direction, too. Again, I'm right handed. So the easiest positions to draw in are going diagonally in this direction because my shoulder is down here shoulder and my fingertips fingers reach out this way 
Okay, so this zone is easier for me to draw in. Um, I can draw up to this angle if I start moving my shoulders around, and I can draw down to about here. But what I can't do, I can't draw. Uh, I can't. I can't draw flat way down here without being very uncomfortable. I haven't rotated my screen. I'm not moving in my chair. It's just that my elbow is now like stabbing myself in the stomach and it's really unpleasant so I don't like it so there's this kind of angle this kind of comfort zone here right where I can draw somewhere in there and really it's not doesn't need to be fan shaped I mean I can draw this direction too but I'm sort of limited right now what if I need to draw a perfectly straight line or a perfectly horizontal line what do I do um, one thing besides rotating the screen is if I can line it up um, somewhere higher on my screen then it's easier to move my elbow past myself okay if I move this down here now I'm hitting like my legs and my stomach and I'm, I'm jostling myself and I can't get my arm comfortably moving horizontally across this page so if I want to slice this um, this circle in half I'm gonna put it way up at the top so that I can comfortably practice and hit that line as well. Uh, if I wanted to do a vertical, same thing might be true. If I put it over here where my shoulder is, it's too close to my shoulder. I can't use my arm compared to over on the left where I can more easily make a nice line like that. Okay? You may also find that you prefer to either uh, make your strokes going away from yourself, up, or towards yourself, down. I have never concretely found a preference for myself. Um, I find that pulling towards me is more stable and accurate, and pushing tends to be more fluid, but I think I'm full of it, and that's not even real, and it's all in my head. So whatever makes sense to you, really. All I will say is that if you're doing a line towards your shoulder, that's kind of punishing. Okay, as long as you're doing it in a, in a direction away from your shoulder corner, whatever that is, lower left or lower right, you're probably going to be fine. And then just really take advantage of rotating your canvas to keep comfortable. Ultimately, it's just about comfort. Can you do a fluid line which looks right to you, which is not hurting your arm or your hand to do? That would be the important thing. Okay, does so all that seem to make sense? Mm hmm cool let me see if there's anything else as far as like bad habits oh yes yes there is okay I think I may have to draw a diagram for this one so let's say that you're drawing something on a table so here's your table doop, 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 and you've got your piece of paper on your table and you're sitting over here in like a little computer chair or something like that and you're sitting up straight and you've got your pencil doodling on this and you're looking down at your paper at this kind of angle here okay do you know that you're distorting your drawing by doing that by, by... by putting it on a flat table and standing back the angle that you're looking at will be different yeah you're not gonna see this when you look down right you're gonna see this okay so if you tried to draw a perfect circle on a completely perpendicular surface to you you draw a perfect circle if you try to draw a perfect circle on a tilted surface like this then maybe through the magic of digital tools I can actually copy paste this and distort it let's see do I remember what the hotkey is uh, oh, oh, do I remember I don't remember curse you Krita and your excellent drawing tools but you're not so good image manipulation tools fine I'll just draw it it would mean that the corners here would actually be further apart and so this would be something more like a potato right once you bring the paper back into a normal perspective. All right, let's get rid of those. 
And so it would stretch it out. It would do something like that. And actually, I'm drawing it too short still. It should be up. So it would kind of be like, eh, like this. OK? So what I'm getting at there is if you've got a, regardless of if you're using paper or not, get this perpendicular to your face. OK? So if your face is looking down at your drawing surface, right? Here's your ear. Here's your eye. If your face is looking down at your drawing surface like this, but your drawing is down here, that's bad. Okay, get something to prop that up so that you can at least get it at something close to a perpendicular angle. That can be like um, a support or like a, a laptop pad like uh, Robert and I were talking about earlier, um, or one of those tables that, that has hinges in it, drawing table, whatever. Try to get it at least somewhat perpendicular to your face. Okay. Does that make? Like that with uh, we had to do portraits on an eighteen by twenty four book. Yeah. And it was very difficult because the top, no matter how you did it, it was so hard to draw. It's such a big. Yeah. Piece. Well, typically the solution for life drawing is an easel, and an easel is great because you stand up to use it. So you've got like these feet, and some sort of like central pillar and then some back support back there. And so now you get to stand way up high and just draw looking straight across at the thing, right? And that's cool, but you know, we typically don't do that with digital tools. I mean, maybe you've got a standing desk or something like that, but probably not, right? Now, yeah. So I've actually got an ergonomic arm on uh, my desk where there's this clamp that like clamps to the side of the desk and it's got one arm with a pivot and a second arm and then it attaches to my monitor so that I can lift the thing up, I can lift it down, I can rotate it, I can whatever I want um, and I originally only got it because I wanted to be able to tilt my monitor more comfortably. But, so that's a solution or you can always just kind of put it in your lap so if your desk is here right and you may or may not have like a keyboard thing underneath here but then your legs are going to go right under your desk, something like that, and you sit up or not in your chair. Just put your, your drawing support thing like here, just put it against your thighs and like the side of the desk. At least that will get the angle a bit better. Unfortunately, it's a little cramped sometimes. And if you've got arms on your computer chair, uh, your drawing arm is going to be hitting those all the time. So be careful about what kind of solution you use. but don't draw at a very extreme angle to whatever surface you're using. It's going to be very deceptive and you're going to have a bad time if you do that sort of thing. Okay? Um, yeah. Ah! I was just going to say that one, yeah. That one is the classic. <laughs> so, if you if you do have, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you do have this leaning up against the desk, I mean, this guy might be doing this, right, instead. And then his neck is going to hurt because he's looking almost straight down at his knees suddenly because it's all down here. It's like, ah, oh, don't do that either if you can help it. Um, ideally, you should try to sit up nice and straight in your computer chair, but in order to do that, like this poor person over here on this desk, this drawing would have to be way up here in the air for them to be looking straight over at it. So how high exactly is that supposed to be supported? Do whatever you can to try to get a comfortable position, but definitely like slouching over in your chair like this, and then like reaching way over to, to do your drawing is gonna hurt everything eventually. Okay, so don't do that. Um, sitting bolt upright, woo, way up here. I hope that means that your drawing thing is way up here in the air because if it's anywhere near back down at your desk, well, we've got the same problem as before now because your posture is too good. Okay, so don't do that either. Just be comfortable and try to get some sort of perpendicular angle to your, your drawing surface if you can. Okay. Hopefully my Nonsensical, nonsensical chicken scratch drawings make sense to you guys. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, because uh, I have 
have a uh, uh, a table that I always like draw on, and I kind of slightly uh, hunch over. Mm-hmm. Like when I like my hat. It's a really tough one to break, um, and because I went to a school that taught animation, they made fun of us, and they call that the animator hunch. So you have like your pegboard, and you'd have your paper, and you would have to flip your drawings or roll your drawings. So you have to get a hand like all the way underneath the stack of drawings on one side, and your drawing hand on the other side, right? Which means that you are already hunched over the drawing table no matter what you do. And so you get like these Quasimodo people with their head way down here and their back way up there and both their arms like really close and their eyes far too close to what they're drawing and it's just awful. Hard. Yeah, it hurts. So be careful about that. Um, try to be aware of what hurts when you're drawing and try to take some steps to change whatever it is. So for me, it's always my neck that hurts and it's because I tend to do a neck jutted forward thing even though my posture is pretty good I sit well back in my chair I actually took off one of the arms of my swiveling desk chair uh, so that my drawing arm is uninhibited so I only have one arm on my chair um, but my neck always hurts because although I've got you know my chair is back and I've got a nice elevated drawing surface then I lean just a little bit forward that would be fine and then my neck does this. Eh. <laughs> okay, as long as I could stop doing that, then I would be fine, but it's a bad habit. So I try to consciously lean my head back and maybe even rest it on the on the chair head, head rest back here, if I can, okay? Now I have an excuse. I, now I can tell people that's why I have bad posture. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'd be better to not have bad posture, but yes, I guess you could. <laughs> I'm an artiste. I need to suffer for my craft. I usually um, use a pillow to like prop up my books when I draw, or my tablet when I draw. Yeah, I, that's one way. Yeah, there's lots of things that you can do. Just do try to do something. Don't just take it for granted that you're going to physically deform yourself or be hurt all the time in order to draw things uh, for school. That shouldn't be the the acceptable solution. Okay. Cool. Um, any questions that you guys have about like good or bad habits, things that you should do, shouldn't do? Those are great tips. Cool. Thank you. Usually I get a little muscle sore when we teach uh, figure drawing in the classroom because I haven't stood up and drawn with my arms extended for so long, but then eventually I get used to it and it feels fine. Uh, but that's the one downside to drawing in person like that. Cool. Uh, do any of you guys want me to look at stuff that you've got? Uh, I have the submissions folder here, and I can look through some of them, maybe talk about what I'm seeing. Uh, keep in mind these do not have to be perfect, but I can point out the kinds of habits that I'm already seeing in them. I like to talk about mine because I struggle with proportion. Okay. Uh, what's, your, what's your name in here? Lydia, excuse me. I would also like to talk about mine. Okay. Lydia, did you did you already put images in the folder? Yeah, oh, oh, here they are. Yeah, it's your last name, right? Houston. Yeah, so like this one, this one, and then I think it's that, that, and then that's someone else, right? So those three? Would that be it? That one is, that one is my most recent. Okay. Uh, hard to say about proportion since it's just kind of a silhouette of a face, but I am seeing some of the scratchy line thing. Right? So all along this... That's me. Okay, so now consciously what you want to do then is draw lighter to start off with. So let me... Whoa, didn't want to do that. There we go accidentally docked it to the side. So I'm just going to sketch here on my canvas. So draw lighter to start off with to get the positioning in in a way that you like. And then if you don't like something about it at this stage, erase a little bit 
and usually with traditional tools you have to be much lighter handed erase a little bit adjust the position to whatever the new position is then when you like it try to make one fluid line right one fluid line for each part of it and then unfortunately I'm so used to digital tools that I'm just used to trying and then un undoing and trying again but with paper you tend to have a lot more resistance on the surface so you can be a little bit more stable okay get some nice fluid lines and then use your kneaded eraser usually to get rid of the smallest little ghostly bit so that you've got a nice cleaned up drawing okay that's what I would recommend for like the the scratchiness as far as proportion goes I can't really see any because we're we're very very close up but what I will say is that some of this is indicative of what I call symbol language so you've got a eye here which is close to how an eye looks from the side but isn't entirely structurally thought out because when we draw in figure drawing a side um, of an eye or an eye aiming in a different direction we're gonna start with a sphere because we know there's an eyeball in there and then we're gonna think about the angles of like here's the center of the sphere I would be looking in this direction at where a tear duct would be hidden back there and where the edge of the eye would be um, visible over on this side and there's going to be lines that wrap around this sphere that create the opening right that go all the way down here so this line would wrap around and then there would be another one that wraps around over here and then we would see the surface of the eyeball right so you see how much different that approach is from what you're doing right so I'm thinking three-dimensionally I'm thinking as if I'm looking kind of through an x-ray and all of that's gonna help to solidify everything place it with authority and make sure that it looks very very well thought out before you do the final steps of adding details and things like this stage won't last forever this would be the constructive phase but then once I'm doing like little wrinkles and things in the eyelid maybe I'm not gonna keep doing that forever and especially with like you know eyelashes I'm gonna think about it but I'm probably not gonna measure like a specific angle that all the eyelashes need to go that would be going like overkill okay uh, let's see so we've got this one as well right okay so yeah we're gonna try to get you to think more three-dimensionally and about um, how we're positioning things in space and especially like for the the arms everything's hidden underneath a blouse but I can see I think toes down there right and it's because you know that this person has got feet you know they've got toes but you've drawn them in such a way that now they're very very short and squat right probably their legs should have just gone off screen and we wouldn't see their feet because their feet would be somewhere way down here but you fit them in because you know they have toes okay so parts part of what's gonna help with that is measuring things as opposed to just kind of estimating or thinking that this is how big it needs to be and what you'll find is a lot of parts of the body are either hidden or they go off the page and that's fine um, but you're fitting them in right now because you kinda got a stick figure view in your head of what needs to be there okay let's see what's oh there's one more right and this one right here so same sort of thing with the face that we need to start measuring things and getting proportions um, how is there something wrong with the facial proportions that you can see in this one? Oh yes, a lot. What what would you say though? What is what is wrong? Uh, the nose um, is not well defined. Uh, the wrinkles on because uh, that's supposed to be me. I okay. Was, uh, drawing as I was putting myself in a mirror. Do you know what I mean by proportions? Like how big things are, how far apart they are. Like, can you see errors in those things? Yeah, especially my, my face picture. That the, the way I draw my face is just out of proportion. Oh, I mean, in this drawing in particular, can you see parts that are too big or too small, too close or too far apart? Yes. Which ones? Uh, like my um, uh, cheekbones. Are what? Chin, What's, what about your cheekbones? Are they too small, too big, too far apart, too close together? Too far apart, too big. 
Okay, too big. Uh, what else? Um, my face is not that long. There you go. That's the biggest one. I, I was almost entirely sure that your face was not this long because I can see that the lips are very far apart from the bottom of the nose and that wouldn't yeah. be normal, right? Usually there's a very small gap there. Sometimes there's a bigger one, but not usually, right? Um, so some things like measuring facial proportions are gonna help here. I would say it's typical that if you go from the eyebrows to the bottom of the nose, that gap, the size there, would be the same size if you did it one more time to the bottom of the chin, which would only bring us about here, right? So often when we measure like facial proportions, body proportions, we do it by measuring halves or we'll take some, some measurement of something and duplicate it several times to find how wide or how tall something is. And so that's what's gonna start helping you is doing those measurements first, right? So when you first started drawing that face, did you do something like this, which is to say, here's my head and here's how big it is and then find and place all the features. Like I would draw a line probably somewhere halfway through and then find like, here's the center. And then I could, well, there's the center. And I could say, okay, so to divide this into thirds, I would say the hairline is gonna go up here somewhere. And then the brow line is probably gonna be around here, nose, chin. Does this seem familiar? How did you place them? Like, how did you pick the positions that you that you picked? I just made a circle, and then I tried to, um, you know, to cross up, uh, put the line across of where I wanted my eyes, my nose. Oh, my so you made a circle, and then he said, "I should go about uh, here." Exactly. Okay, don't do that. <laughs> so that that's how it'll go wrong, right? Instead. You should look at here's a distance between the top of the thing and this would be one of the thirds of the head and I want that same distance here and I want that same distance here that way I've got one third two thirds three right and they sure but okay so that technique is something you can start practicing then instead of just saying uh, about here actually measure the width and the height of things in order to get a reliable measurement okay and oh, sure. if it means that you have to take your actual pencil and put it down on the page like this and then measure from like the tip of the pencil to wherever you can line up your thumb on the thing and then move it so we're measuring here's how wide this pencil marking is and then we move it somewhere else like down here to get that same distance then that's one way to do measurement or you can use a ruler uh, or you can do it based on sight, but doing it based on sight is a lot harder typically. So I would recommend doing it based on moving your drawing tool around the page. Okay? Yeah, totally. That's pretty cool. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. So all of the things I'm going to teach in this class are going to have this kind of structural underpinning to them. Um, we're almost never going to get to this amount of detail, but it would just be a matter of continuing the drawing past the constructive stages that we're going to do. That's all. All right, who else was saying they wanted me to look at stuff in the folder? Me. And what's the name? Uh, Jimenez. Okay, so all these ones here? Like yes. like this one? Okay. So first, this picture is taken at an angle. So make sure in the future when you take pictures, get it perpendicular to the page so that I can see it undistorted. Okay. okay. Uh, let me look through real quick. So we got this one, this one, this one, <laughs> these. Uh, hands are pretty de decent, those ones. And then this one is uh, gridded, I think. Yes. Is that from a photograph? Uh, yeah, from a photograph. Okay. And then uh, some observational drawing and a little little blob man. <laughs> Okay, 
So I'm seeing a lot of symbol language from you. And what I mean by that is like anime eyes are a symbol language. They're not representative of real anatomy, right? They're a comic book or a, a sort of cartooning staple. And there's lots of them. So a real eye is like a, there's an eyeball behind some flesh. It's got a circular kind of surface to it. The tear duct extends slightly away from that and there's like flesh filling in that section, but it cuts off the visible portion of this sphere. The iris and pupil are on the surface of that. They get cut off by folds of fat. They overlap. There's depth, you know, there's an eye socket around that. There's like hair and stuff, tons of stuff. And so obviously when we do cartoons, we don't want to do all that. It's way too much work. And so what cartoonists do is, you know what? That'll do it. <laughs> and that's a symbol language I. You still know what this is. In fact, you probably would recognize this more easily than this crazy detailed, you know, eyeball that I'm drawing, unless I go all the way to like photographic with this one. This one's faster to recognize. And then there's like this one, or we do that. And then there's like, I don't know, these ones, and those are eyes too, and like little winky girly eyes and stuff like that. They're all symbols. They're cartooning. Okay. They represent the right thing, but they don't look anything like the right thing. Okay? So I love cartooning, first of all, and I'm not really opposed to anime either, which it looks what like what some of the influences, but you have to learn the photographic uh, representation of the thing before you start branching out into the into the symbol language stuff. Because drawing these things is easy, but it's also trivial. Like it doesn't really stretch you or, or make you imagine or force you to um, solve any problems. But coming up with that symbol language in the first place, the person who thought, you know, it would be just okay if I just have the iris hanging down from a line, that person had to really carefully measure against photographic realism and think, is this going to look weird? Am I going to freak people out? Is this going to be universally recognizable? And the answer was, yeah, yeah, it is. And so what I would recommend is stick to photographic drawing while you're practicing, do whatever you want when you're having fun. And I love cartooning when I'm having fun, but you'll find it starts to bleed in and influence the way that you do your cartooning too, which can be good. Yeah. Uh, as far as like, I can see a bunch of the scratchy line stuff, which I would, you know, recommend trying to uh, draw smoother, longer strokes like I was recommending. Um, what sort of uh, tools do you use? Is it mostly pencil? Uh, is it like number two pencil or do you have a number of different uh, like H and B pencils? Um, I have like different kinds. Like okay. Do you use the, the H's for early and the B for later? Yeah. Okay, good. Just make sure that um, that's what you're doing so that you don't commit too early to something. Um, this one, the gritting one is kind of interesting because I sort of doubt that his face had this big divot in it in the side. Did it really do that in the photograph? Yes. Did it do it that much? Yeah. Hmm. I'm not so sure. Was he deformed? Slightly. Okay, so he had like an injury? Yes. Ah, okay. All right. So it looked odd because of that because I couldn't be sure. It might have just been a pronounced chin, a certain angle, and a sallow cheek. But because you said that, okay, it makes more sense that it'd be a little bit asymmetric like that. Um, did you find the gridding helped you at all? Yes, uh, very a lot. Okay, something you should do with gridding for the future though. When you, when you are using gridding, you get these intersection points, right? Here's where that line crosses, here where that, where that line crosses. You definitely don't need the, the scratchy lines if you're using gridding because you've got a road map, right? Just connect the dots nice and fluid once you've got that roadmap, okay? All right. Cool. Thank you. Uh, do you have any specific questions? Or you just wanted me to comment in general? Like the neckline, or like how do I do with the neck and everything? A neck? A neck is a tube. So, well, it's a tube, but it's also got more complicated bits. So our skull 
is kind of a ball, right? But it's got a little extra bit on the front. Our neck connects to a shoulder, which is sort of a plane, but it kind of tilts forward a little bit. Okay? And that neck sockets into that shoulder girdle at an angle and bends a little bit backwards up into the center of the skull. More than that, it also kind of connects to the lower jaw area. So whereas we have this jawline, what we think of as the jawline is the visible part, there's actually this little secondary plane underneath there, right? And so not only does it attach like to the back of the skull and the inside bottom of the big circular skull, it also bends a little bit. And then to make it even more complicated, there's muscles on top of that. Sometimes there's the uh, Adam's apple if you're drawing a male. And then there's also additional muscular features that are present on the sides of the shoulders, which make it look different too. Not to mention bones. So altogether, it's complicated. <laughs> That's why. If you had to just do one thing though, golf ball, bendy tube. Okay? That at least gets close <laughs> to what a neck is. Golf ball and bendy tube. Okay. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Does that make sense though? Because yeah. what I can see is like you have noticed that a neck is a column and that it has lines other than just straight up and down, but you don't know what those lines mean. What those lines mean are um, these, sorry, let me draw a flat one. So just like yours, you had this, but then you had this, right? Well, these back here, those are latissimus muscles, right? They're on the back. They attach somewhere on the spine back here, but they are overlapped by like these um, uh, sternocleidomastoid muscles, which attach underneath the ear. They're the ones that come down at an angle towards the center and attach down by the suprasternal notch. You've also got the Adam's apple in the middle. So if seen from the side, you might get a little step out like that, especially on teenagers. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on. That's why it's so hard to represent the neck. <laughs> cool? Cool. Okay. And we'll learn all about it. The actually shoulders and neck is one of the earlier modules that we'll be doing because um, it's the start of the, the torso. Uh, who else has stuff in this that you want me to look? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Robert is, is freaking out. It's not latissimus, it's trapezius. You're absolutely right. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> I'm the freaking anatomy teacher. I'm saying the wrong muscle. <laughs> Science words are annoying. Yeah, they are. We're going to have a whole glossary to refer to also. I would like to review. Maria. Okay, starting right here. I have a question. Yes. On the pencils, um, you asked um, that the previous lady um, that, um, that she used um, the H's mm -hmm. first and the B. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I'm not familiar yeah. with the, um, the pencils. So H, and these are all graphite, I believe. H is towards the higher numbers, so 1H, 2H, 3H, etc., are hard. I, I hope that's what H stands for, but they're hard lead, meaning that they are light and sharp, right? So the higher number H you have, the sharper and lighter it's going to look when you draw with them. An HB pencil is like a school pencil. So that's the most common one you'll find it all the time. A B pencil, I don't know what the B stands for, but they're the soft ones and they get darker. So maybe it stands for black. Uh, so like a 1B, 2B is a very common one people use, 3, 4, etc. They get softer, darker, and blurrier. And so if you draw with the B pencils early, you get very dark, hard to erase lines that smear when your hand touches them, right? If you draw with the H's, you get sharp, precise little light lines that are hard to see and don't look very nice, but are e oh bold. Yeah, I think it's bold. Um, they're easy to draw over top of because they're so flimsy. So the balance between the two, HB, is what you see most of the time. It's a little bit dark. It's a little bit sharp. It's 
kind of the best of both worlds. But when you're doing a long form drawing, you want to start on the H side to do your underlying thought process because it's really easy to erase and ignore. Then work your way towards the darker side and end with the darkest ones because they're the most likely to smear and mess up your drawing. That makes sense? Yeah. And it's sort of mirrored by the same thing we'll do in digital tools just using pressure and different brush selection is start light, then true it up with a slightly darker stroke, and then finish it off usually with some fully inked you know, brush or something like that over the top. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Maria. Cool. We got some like fan art stuff and some Naruto, which I just got my wife to watch for the first time. And some Sailor Moon. This is still yours, right? Yeah, it is. Okay, and so here's some life drawings. So this was from my last class. Okay. Uh, you did these all on paper. Um, the, the three on the, the lady, the man, and the portrait of me, we had to do in ink, and we couldn't erase. Oh, boy. Hard. We'll work with this and try. Yeah, I was going to ask that, because it did look like that, and it's like it's so hard to do something like that. It's better to have a lot of familiarity with ink tools before you attempt it. I know that um, I have buddies that do storyboard and they sketch in ink because their art is such that you have to work so quickly that there isn't very much time to edit and it gives them a, a very strong sense of purpose and um, of surety in whatever they draw, but it's torture for the rest of us. So I definitely wouldn't recommend it most of the time. Um, is this one you or is this someone else? No, that's not. Okay. Um, just based on what I see, I mean, clearly fan art is supposed to look like, you know, characters that are already designed. I don't see a lot in terms of like three-dimensional construction. And that would be the big thing that's lacking. Even in this Fortnite um, llama, I don't see a whole lot of three-dimensional drawn construction, which is really called for in the llama because it's kind of square. Uh, and boxy, uh, but places where I, I would be able to notice is like this round cat, or sometimes in some of the angles in Tracer, like her thigh and her shin, we should be able to see some three-dimensional construction. I did see a little bit on Yoda's fingers. Um, there is a bit here, but it's starting to get kind of squished and weird. So rather than drawing what you want the final product to look like, draw construction. So I'm going to just take Naruto there as for an example. Um, let's see. That's Over here. I, I never learned uh, structure. I learned structure. Looking at something and then okay. figuring out how to do it. Structure is all about um, three-dimensional you know, representations of things. So his body is kind of a box. And I would just sort of like lean it slightly to the side like this and decide how much of the top of this box am I going to see. Not very much, although it looked like he was kind of hunching his shoulders. And then based on that, I could decide that this is anything running left, right across his chest. This is anything going back along his side and anything going straight up and down would go like this. Now, how much of that stuff is actually doing that? Well, not a lot, but his zipper, right? His zipper should go from his navel or his belt buckle line up to the base of his neck. So it should go vertical. But then it's also kind of like wrinkled based on his sweater. So at the very least, if I place like the bottom of the box down here, I say his zipper starts here and it ends up there. I'm going to start with that line and then say, oh, OK. And also, it needs to bend out from that line when the, when the sweater bulges and then sweep back and then bend out again, right? And however many times. And I can kind of get a line derived from that, that way. And then these folds in his sweater, right? Well, they're gonna run right along those bulges I just made because now we've got the bottom and top of a pipe going this way, right? And same thing here. I'm doing this kind of quick, but, and same thing here, just happens to coincide with those lines. So see how I'm getting like a three-dimensional kind of idea built up that way? Yeah. It's really tough to do this and talk about details compared to like just limbs, because limbs are just tubes, and then you've got 
a little bit of bone and muscle structure and sometimes clothing over the top of it. So in particular, like this arm where he's clenching it in front of him, I would expect his hand to be much larger because it should be held in front of him somewhat. And also the question of how close is his elbow to his stomach? If it's right on it, then his shoulder needs to jet way higher because you can't touch your elbow to your stomach without moving your shoulder out of the way. It's just like, it'll hit your hip instead. Um, you see what I mean? Yeah, I understand. So I would determine, like, just to draw over the top of this in kind of a, of a weird way, his clavicles are doing this. Uh, his upper arm for that side would probably be going back like this direction. And then the lower arm, I guess, is coming up a little bit higher this direction. Even just those for a start helps. Let me erase out a little bit so I can draw on top of it. But then I'm going to want to notice, um, well, it's got to be traveling forward. So this cylinder is probably going to look like this somewhat. Kind of my guess is that it would be coming towards us slightly. And then this next one is definitely coming towards us a little bit also, but probably less maybe about here, fairly flat. And then he's got his hand extended out. And just for the sake of placing it in, I'll just make a box to say that's where I think it would be. I've drawn his hand roughly equal with his shoulder. When I, what, from what I know about proportions, that would be about correct unless the camera angle has changed and we're looking down at the character. Or in this case, it looks like, yeah, maybe his body has hunched forward more than I thought. And so his neck attachment is here and his shoulders would be here and here. And then he shrugged his shoulders. And so now his shoulders way up here and his fist can be way down here. But that's just his neck attachment. His actual head would still be somewhere like that, right? Whatever it is, the, the answer is construction, <laughs> right? Because it's how you um, make real lasting and um, visible decisions about the direction everything goes. Cool? Cool. Cool. Very good. Uh, who else? Who, that was a very quiet. James, okay. Uh, is, uh, what's your last name, Ramos? Um, there, there you are. We got us some Sonic. There's a little sonic boy. The angles of those birds are pretty good, actually. Head overlapping, wings, body behind it. This one in particular down on the left looks quite three-dimensional. Um, some of them are a little flatter, but yeah, not too bad. And then is this you as well? Next five. Okay. okay. I think you are kind of drawing directly from reference and sort of like photocopying reference in some ways and one or well I'm, what i mean is like the swat cats thing did you have poses that look just like that to draw from no okay yeah it's pretty good then especially that one i like that you've got this raised shoulder and some of the like anatomy of the back is evident along with this cross section of the straps being far over to the left there is some three-dimensional presence there so that's pretty good um, this one works very very nicely this one works less nice this one works not at all spider-man's falling apart can you see what's going on with spider-man that makes him look so weird Yeah, and there's some, th yeah, there's some things like, I don't quite know which direction his butt was supposed to be pointing. And his belt seems to be put on sideways here, which would be okay as long as his leg wasn't over here. But for his leg to be there, the thigh would run out right about here. And then we've got like a huge expanse for where his hips should fit. And I don't know which which way they're going. So it's like he's split in two kind of that either his belt would not be visible at all or underneath here somewhere and his leg would be a little bit less um, less forward 
or this leg is in completely the wrong position um, and then it would make sense that his butt's over here somewhere. That makes sense. Do you draw through the the figure? Um, in your construction, are you using a lot of three dimensional shapes, or are you kind of just placing it on the page? Okay. So for some of this, it worked. Like the arms on this guy look just fine. His lower body, not as much. His head looks okay. On these, it looks excellent. Like these actually look like they have construction. This one, it completely fell apart. So I don't know if you know what the difference was between this and the others, but the three dimensional representation of him just doesn't work. Was it just like, just rushing? Hmm. Oh yeah, okay. Better to spend more breaks making it nice than just get it done in one break. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, any particular questions? Cool. All right, very good. Uh, anyone else in this folder that they wanted me to look at? I do. I do. Uh, names? What letter does that start with? Uh, N. N, yeah, okay. There we go. Take a look there. I just have a problem with like hand portions. So feel like you feel like, like they're big, bigger than. Um, possible. If you. Did you learn from like a um, comic book reference or like. Uh, anatomy reference or something like that? How did you learn to draw hands? Oh, uh, I just watched, like, Jim Lee had, like, a really, like, neat trick on how to do it, so I learned from him. Uh, okay. He draws superheroes. Yeah. Guess what superheroes have? Big, big hands. <laughs> big manly hands, because they've got to, like, punch people and, like, climb buildings and stuff like that. So that might be why that happened. Um, they also might be a little bit too anatomical for this particular kind of drawing, right? Because I look at the face, and it's anatomical, but it's a little bit um, smoothed out and a little bit cartoon. But the hands appear to have more tendons than I'm comfortable with comparing it to the, the face, right? So there's a little inconsistency there, that's all. Um, as far as the size of them, yeah, I suppose they are a little bit large compared to what I would expect for this character. Is that a female character? Uh, it's male. <laughs> it's male? Okay. Maybe even still, even still, kind of looking at the facial proportions and the, the width of the shoulders. Yeah. Also, a little bit strange, the angle of the forearm and the bicep doesn't look like they ever meet at an elbow. And it's kind of true of this one, too. So it looks like the, the upper arm's going farther away from the body than I would expect for them reaching here at their center yeah. chest. Yeah. yeah, it's like if I took my hand and I just cover over the outer port. Yeah, actually, if you take your hands on the screen and just cover the outer parts of the upper arms, it looks a lot more realistic. Kind of interesting. Okay. Oh, cool. That one looks really nice. I love the snakes on the face and they're very well drawn like when when we're gonna talk about form later on you guys um, look at these snakes and how you can tell they're coming forward down backward across forward across backward right because of those stripes that's something that you want to do on your limbs and on your torso to make sure that you get a good three-dimensional presence also notice that it's a squirrely line right but it's following the cheek contour right the cheek contour is just sweeping along right towards the chin but that snake is following the cheek contour so is this one over here right so are these forehead ones they're following the larger shapes that's what form is right we want all of the small shapes to follow the bigger shapes to follow the bigger shapes to follow the bigger shapes until it all builds up to one thing 
Another kind of example of that is the hair, in which it's coming out of the head, sweeping down and across the face because it's seated, seated on top of a skull, right? So that's another one. So there's a lot of good stuff happening here. I think that you sometimes use some really good construction and rules that you've learned and sometimes abandon them. <laughs> that's what I'm seeing. Yes. So in the nose, the nose does not look constructed. It, it looks like a symbol. It looks like here's a nostril, here's the bulb part of the nose, here's a, um, a you know, nostril, but I have no idea what angle it's supposed to be going at based on the eyebrows and the position of the eyes on the head I think this person is tilting their head downward that would mean there's no chance of us seeing nostril we should only be seeing bulb but that's also a guess because I didn't really see this person but it's what looks inconsistent to me make sense okay so you're, you're using some quite difficult to achieve perspective and construction sometimes and then not at all in other places like the um, the choker doesn't look consistent either it's not wrapping around the neck in a cylinder shape it's just kind of cutting off on the side right um, I can sympathize with this though because construction's hard it takes a long time and it gets boring but it it saves you from making weird mistakes too <laughs> uh, cool yeah I mean I can see you do know quite a lot of perspective we'll try to work on using it where it counts the most and not ignoring it where it's gonna be obvious because okay. like like even over here like I see there's a perspective ear perspective ears are a bitch they're so hard to do so hard to yeah they're always hard and here's that choker and it looks great Right? So you can do it. We just got to pick and choose when it's the most important and what's going to stand out if you don't do it, I think. Cool. Thank you. Uh-huh. Uh, who else? We have one more, I thought. Jim. I'll take it. You'll take it. <laughs> Robert, is your stuff in here? Yeah, the one thing I did in five minutes is I haven't drawn anything in nine months. Oh, this one right here? There he is. Cool. Um, for those of you maybe unfamiliar, this is um, a line of action, and there's a gesture underneath that, and then you skipped all the steps and went right to the end of putting muscles on it. Bad Robert. There's more steps than this, and you know it. But it's, 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 it's very important. It makes it look real. <laughs> it's very important. So you got a gesture. I would say the gesture is pretty much right on. I, I agree with it. You've got this flat face going straight up and down based on the photograph. Based on your gesture, I'm not sure if that's the angle that that head would have ended up in. I think you're trying to make your drawing look too much like the photograph based on accuracy and not based on what line you're committing to. So it's it's a difficult thing for me to articulate but I'll tell you that after years of study and drawing I learned something which is approximately no one's ever going to see your references it's your drawing do what you want right something like that so if if it were me and I wanted to change the angle of the head I just go ahead and do it make it farther back make it farther forward I'd make it comfortable and internally consistent in my drawing because once I turn this reference off, nobody's ever going to see it ever again, right? Um, the angle of the shoulders, if we are going for accuracy, should be a lot shallower. So I can see here's the tip of a collarbone, tip of a collarbone. Doesn't appear to be shrugging very much. It's a bit shallower than this angle here. And also rotated a bit, uh, which I don't really see here. I guess it's because we're missing the, the pecs kind of like coming all the way up here. Uh, but generally, you know, you're following the steps, but I know you know more steps than this, and you got to do that construction step. That construction step is the key. You cannot skip that. Your drawings will look like wiggly spaghetti if you don't do it. 
Wiggly spaghetti. There we go. What if you like wiggly spaghetti? Well, then draw you some. Like stiff spaghetti. Yeah, I know. Nobody eats stiff spaghetti. Then draw wiggly spaghetti if you like wiggly spaghetti. Don't draw a person. Poor guy. <laughs> All right. Uh, anybody else want me to look at their stuff? I guess. Uh, uh oh, I hid Discord by accident when I wiggled that. Uh, who said that? Uh, Eric. Eric. Sanchez. Sanchez. There we go. One of them's HTML, and I'm afraid. What'll uh, What'll happen? Let's see. Let's see. The other two are not. I mean, I'll click it if you say so, but. Yeah. Yeah. Safe for work. Safe for work. Safe it is, for work. If it is, I don't know. Oh, it's just a Google Drive link. Okay, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully. Okay. Yeah, he's gonna. All of them are trash. Is it classwork or is it? Yeah, or, I forgot what it is. I think it's yeah, up to this point. Okay. And trash is too strong a word, right? <laughs> Everything is a work in progress. Everything, right? You're always trying to learn something. And if it were perfect, then I wouldn't have a job to do and you wouldn't have nothing to learn and you would have just wasted your money on a class, right? So let's look at what's done right and wrong. Um, what's that? No, I was going to say there's one, it's like the very last one, where I, where you, I take your advice of, you know, old. No. Oh, we got to stay here yeah no, no it's the very last one right? or, yeah down here yeah that guy yeah i mean your line quality is way better yeah i just i heard where you said about like boldness i'm like all right let me just do this real quick yeah i mean i can see a big difference between like the construction lines and your finalized lines in that one what i will say though in general let me go back to the start is you're drawing too dark right from the start so lighten up a lot. Are you using charcoal? Uh, yeah, uh, first go around was with like a charcoal pencil. I'm like, okay, this is bad. Do this with the normal pencil. Yeah, the, th went, the thing about charcoal is you're basically unable to draw light with charcoal. Yeah. Right? So we tend to do life drawing with charcoal because it forces you to commit and not be wishy washy. It's sort of like marker in a way. Um, but if you do want to do construction lines and build on top of them, you kind of either have to use a harder charcoal like vine or graphite to do that sort of thing. So yeah, I would say in general, you're drawing way too dark. Um, just overall, I would expect more like, uh, wow, the proportion got all weird, more like this for construction, right? That slowly gets darker over the course of the drawing. But then also you're very much focused on silhouette which we're not going to draw hardly any silhouette at all. And it's one of the big mistakes that I'm going to try to solve for everybody right away is that the outer edge of the thing we're drawing doesn't matter hardly at all, right? And it's weird to say that, right? But let me try to back it up a little bit by showing some of the stuff I've just doodled, okay? I'm saying the outer silhouette doesn't matter hardly at all. Here's kind of my, my defense of that statement this neck and head thing that I drew is angles and shapes and volumes and connection points and directions. I didn't spend any time on the silhouette, but it does look like a head, neck and shoulder, right? That'll just happen, right? What you shouldn't do is go eh, 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 eh. you shouldn't do that, right? Don't spend any time doing that because it's a waste of time and it has nothing to do with the the shape and presence of the thing you're trying to draw anyway okay so i see in here sometimes you're focused on the internal drawing through volumes of the thing and then many times you're just kind of abandoning that okay so spend way more time on that part way less time on the silhouette part but these are pretty dynamic flexible you know, gesture drawings, I will say. Uh, we are going to start with stiffer, less flowy, less fun kind of 
body positions because it's easier to draw um, academically to start out with. And we're going to work towards the more gestural, flexible stuff because that's the harder stuff to do. But yeah, I can see that you've got some of the right steps in mind here, but it's just kind of a priority shift. Cool. Any questions in particular that you want me to address? Okay, but no, trash is too strong a word. Don't call them trash. Never trash. It's a learning. Yeah. You learn along the way. Of course we do. And these are yours too, right? Oh, those are mine. Oh, these are, oh, someone else. That's Joyce, it says. All right, do we have anybody else that wants me to do their stuff? Or are we good for now? This was all stuff that was turned into the first homework submission, which was basically just show me your stuff so I can get an idea of where you're at. No, I actually, and that's a good thing that you mentioned that I think I put the due date as like Sunday or Monday. I'm going to make sure that the due date is always the day that your class is. So it should be like midnight Monday, right before Tuesday, because Tuesday is when your lecture is, or I might even make it like noon on Tuesday or something like that. But really, I want you guys like working on the next thing by that point, okay? So I'm gonna adjust that due date, so don't freak out. Cool. All right, you guys, well, it was good to... Yes, you did. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, you guys. Thank you. It was great to, to see your work and uh, to do a little bit of lecture. I'm going to stop recording now, so this is the end of the YouTube portion.